All right. Looks like we are live. Yep. So good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Cam Lawrence. I work as a project coordinator at the Wisconsin Maritime Museum. Uh, we'll kind of stretch this out as uh, people are probably tuning in here a little bit, but um, thank you all for tuning in uh, for this presentation of naval history as it relates to the state of Wisconsin. Uh, tonight, our presenters are going to be discussing the history of USS Cobia. Uh, so, naval history fans, you may know Cobia is a Gato class submarine, uh, which served in World War II. Um, but after its war service, the boat spent some time um, in and around Milwaukee and became a regular site for the lakefront residents of Bayview. Cobia is now permanently moored in the Manitowoc River um, and is maintained as a museum ship by the Wisconsin Maritime Museum. USS Cobia is regularly open for public tours, overnights, and other learning experiences. Uh, our speaker tonight, BJ Palama, will share with you the history of this boat and some of their research into Cobia's service time, um, both during the war and uh, in Milwaukee and Bayview. DJ is an avid historian and has been involved with the Wisconsin Maritime Museum for six years in various capacities, uh, including tour guide and reenactor. DJ also participates in historical reenactments and other history focused events around the country. In conversation with our presenter tonight is historian and retired shipwreck diver James Hines. Uh, James serves as acquisitions curator yeah. of the Wisconsin Maritime Historical Society. Uh, he works tirelessly sharing stories of Great Lakes maritime history on the WMHS blog posts and the Facebook page. Uh, having been social media manager at the museum. I have definitely shared several of those posts in a pinch. They are excellent, well-researched, we love them. Thank you. Um, thank uh, you. So, um, I would like to thank the Bayview Historical Society uh, for organizing tonight's event and hosting everyone on this online format. Um, and members of the audience, as we're going through, if you have questions, uh, you can type them uh, into the comment section and we can pull them up during the Q&A portion of the presentation. So without further ado, I give you DJ Palama. Okay. Hello. Um, today I'll be talking about the Cobia. Um, first, I'm going to explain a little bit about the Gato class submarines in general as they were built in several different areas outside of just Manitowoc and the Electric Boat Company in Groton, Connecticut. Um, just give you a general layout of it, and then the Cobia's wartime patrol and what she did post-war. So um, we're going to go with here. This is a picture of the silver side, but it kind of would give you an idea of what the Cobia would have looked like while she was being built in uh, Groton, Connecticut. Um, they were the first mass-produced submarines um, for the United States and also for the first time in an attempt to try to create what was known as a fleet class. Uh, submarine, which means that the original intention is that they would have been sort of the forward guard and the rear guard for stuff like battleships and, and other uh, more traditional naval style naval styles of tactic. But obviously with Pearl Harbor damaging much of the Pacific fleet, submarines and aircraft carriers now become the new offensive weapon instead of what was originally meant to be a defensive weapon. Um, 77 were built and um, about uh, 20 of them were lost. So that means we lost in about approximation of 3,000 men over the course of the war. All right, this kind of gives you a general overlay of the uh, submarines of the Gato class. Um, they're kind of divided into seven different rooms or chambers, if you want to. Um, got the conning tower, stuff of that nature. Um, this is directly from the uh, submarine archives from the U.S. Navy. Uh, gi giving you a picture of the forward part of the boat, you can see that it uh, flies the traditional ensign from uh, going back to... Uh, roughly the War of 1812, there would have been 48 stars on that flag for the 48 states in the Union at the time. Um, this gives you a good idea of 
the deck guns and the conning tower. Um, the deck guns were the primary weapons of the Cobia while on surface because each of the Mark 14 torpedoes cost about $10,000 to make. So you can imagine during wartime that adds up, up and up. So the deck guns were meant to try to cripple uh, enemy Japanese merchant vessels by crippling ones that they knew that were weakly armored or um, were already on the verge of sinking. All right, this gives you a pic this gives you an idea of the um, guns that are on the back because again, you got to have as much firepower as possible to try to take down merchant ships, and uh, they would also have machine guns on the side. The bell is um, not really a part of um, the uh, ship while underway because obviously the clanging would make it instantaneously noticeable. But again, that goes back to old nautical traditions of being able to tell time. If you look closely, you might be able to see a broomstick that's on top of the conning tower. And that means when you would go into, let's say, Pearl Harbor or New London in Australia, that means you have a clean sweep, which means you wiped out all of your uh, opponent's ships and used up all of your torpedoes. So it was a signifier that you literally, sort of like in baseball, had a clean sweep of uh, your antagonists. Um, this is a three-inch deck gun. Um, the Cobia historically would have had either a four or a five-inch one, uh, depending on the year of the war because uh, they switched them out for either better conditions, really up to the captain. While they were restoring her, there was no five-inch guns left over from the war, so we currently just have the three-inch deck guns um, until we can find something that's a little more accurate. Um, this is the forward torpedo tube. There would have been six of them in total, um, each of them carrying... Um, at least one torpedo on the inside of them. They would have been mostly the Mark 14 uh, torpedo at that time. Um, this was officer's country. This would have been considered the most comfortable space on the boat. But it's important to keep in mind that um, even the captain who was named uh, Becker, um, his office was no big or his room was no bigger than a walk-in closet so when you would go in there you know it's not very big so even the officers while they might have to have their own individual bunks still had to share a room so there would have been six officers in these areas captain has the room to himself and then the cpos would have had about um the cpos would have had about um uh, five men in their room. Um, this right here, this is the control. Uh, this is the control room. This is kind of the brains of the operations. On top of the ladder, you can um, see where the radar and stuff would be located. Um, right here, this is the. Uh, cruise galley or the mess. This is probably the most important room in terms of being it being a central hub and um, places for uh, the men to not just eat but entertain themselves, read books, watch movies. There are several times where you're on a tour of duty, you might only have about uh, two or three films that were given to you by uh, by the government to watch, and you'd rewatch them over and over again. Um, there is one veteran that said that he watched the wizard of Oz so many times that he never got the song songs out of his head, um, well into later in life. Um, this would be cruise quarters. Um, you'll notice there's only about 36 bunks for a group of 72 men, which means that, um, they did what was called hot bunking where each of the men has had to share, Iraq because of each of their duty and literally when you crawl into the bed everything was already warm on top of the submarine already being 90 degrees Fahrenheit um, this is the forward engine room um, the Cobia and other Gato class submarines were all um, basically electric diesel sort of like a car nowadays these particular ones were made by GM 
Um, this gives you kind of the electrical control room, the little thing that looks like a grid we often call the cubicle, and that controls like where all the electricity and stuff are that are on the boat. And then this is the aft torpedo room. Unlike um, the forward torpedo room, it only has uh, four torpedoes or four, four torpedo rooms in it or four torpedoes in it, which means that, you know, you carry four torpedoes and eight in the rear and then 12 in front. And then this is what the aft side of the Cobia looks like currently. Um, the stair, the little stair ramps are not original to the ship. Those are added on later on so the public can actually go into it. But um, during wartime, that's where the torpedoes would have been loaded through. And then if you're wondering what a cobia is, it's a type of fish that's a small little predatory fish. Um, and this is what the boat is named after. All right, so commissioning. Uh, she was commissioned in November of 1943 and went out to sail from Newport, Connecticut in 1944. Um when uh, she when she when she left the electric boat company, um, she basically had to make her way from the east coast all the way down through the Panama Canal zone. And what makes this area particularly dangerous, especially around Florida and Cuba, was the fact that even as late as 1944, there still was a few German U-boats patrolling the area. It was often called the Turkey Shoot area. So some of the veterans. Um, mentioned that they uh, saw blips of what could be possibly German U-boats in the region. Um, and then uh, on route to Pearl Harbor, um, <clears throat> she was eventually uh, trained, his crew was trained on there, and the first torpedo launches were done in Pearl Harbor in June of 44, and then she was ready for sea by 1944. And then uh, this is a little bit about Captain Becker. He was born in Mississippi in 1911, which means that he was only 32 years old while captain of the submarine. Uh, he saw some duty in the Atlantic uh, theater because the U.S. did have about uh, five or six uh, Gator-class submarines attempting to try to help the British with their convoy system but it was not as extensively big as um, in the Pacific, obviously. And then um, his naval career started in 1936 when he was uh, using pre-war, almost World War I era submarines. And then eventually he became kind of the mothball fleet commander and then retired um, to uh, become a teacher in 19. 64 as the rank of captain in the Navy. All right, so this is the Cobia being launched. Um, you'll notice that this is the traditional style. If you look at Manitowoc, uh, Manitowoc submarines were generally launched, side launched the Great Lake style. Cobia, since she was built in Groton, Connecticut, would have been launched to tr traditional seaway. All right, so this is the commissioning party that would have uh, happened in May of 1944. So you can see the crew is looking nice, young, and fresh. Uh, not not a dirty speck on them. They got nice uniforms, and the girlfriends are with them. Uh, same crew posing for their pictures. Um, this is when she was... Uh, the nautical, this is when the ensigns were first put on to the submarine before she was launched, or sorry, uh, sent out to sea. And this is her decking in uh, 1944, um, so right before she was uh, preparing to leave for Pearl Harbor. Um, officers and crewmen posing again right before um, them going into their first patrol. All okay, to kind of give you an idea, when it comes to uh, where the Cobia's center of attention was, it mostly came from New London, Australia, where she was based. 
and she mostly worked around where you can kind of see this is an allied war plan for a potential invasion of Japan in 1942. Um, so the areas in red were all areas that were conquered by Japan uh, from 1937 onwards. So the Kobia's main actions were mostly around what you see as modern day Borneo, uh, Malaysia, um, the Dutch East, the former Dutch East Indies colonies, um, Indochina slash Vietnam and Thailand. Um, so or basically around that general area for her six tours of duty, because it's important to remember those regions had rubber and oil, which were essential to the Japanese war front effort. And to ask, uh, answer Joel's questions, uh, the Manitowoc uh, ships or boats that were built up here uh, went from Lake Michigan down to Chicago to the Sanitary River, eventually Uh, DJ, if you can hear me, your mic has gone out. All right. Can you hear me again? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so in July of 1944, she left Pearl Harbor's the Bonin Islands, which is probably most famous for the Battle of Iwo Jima. Um, she sank a number of merchant vessels um, prior to, to Iwo Jima, but probably the most significant um, achievement she did was sinking a Maru class transport ship. All right, can you hear me again? Yes. Sorry about that. It's really acting up. Okay. So uh, that being said, um, since they were able to sink the transport ship from the 26th Tank Regiment, that meant that the Japanese did not get more tanks on the island until December, which means that the Marine Corps was able to hold out and then eventually win the battle. And um, after Battle of Iwo Jima ended in... 44, the Cobia was awarded a, a letter of recognition, uh, recognition from the USMC for their help in sinking the um, Maru class. And this is uh, what what it would have looked like um, with several different uh, minor design uh, changes because this is fairly early on in the look, but this is what the tank transport would have looked like. A Maru class within the Japanese uh, Navy or Merchant Marine was pretty much anything that was taken from civilians and then put either into naval use or, um, as dumb as it sounds, the Japanese Army also had its own Navy because the Japanese Army and Navy didn't get along. So if you ever see anything with Maru, it either means it was used by the Navy or it would have been used by the Army. Okay, and um, during that same tour of duty, um, when uh, they sank a merchant uh, vessel, they came across a couple of survivors. Only uh, Ona Tora was the only one that accepted the Americans' offer for being becoming a prisoner of war. So the people, so the members of the crew, ended up calling him Tojo after the military dictator that was in charge of. Uh, most Japanese operations in their empire at the time. So um, he's basically well known on this ship for um, basically on the torpedo on the forward torpedo tubes. Um, they had the they put the Japanese uh, flags for the merchant ships or military vessels that they sunk on it, and he corrected the numbers of stripes on it. And then eventually he went around going around 
repainting things in Japanese kanji. Right now on display, we have um, the auxiliary compass, which he wrote in uh, kanji as radio. So we have that in display. Um, ultimately, um, he was taken to the Marshall Islands and drafted as a worker for the U.S. Marine Corps, but he said he wanted to stay um, within the subcrew because he liked them better than the Marines because he thought the Marines were uh, kind of scary. And this is the crew after um, her first war patrol. Uh, you'll may, you may notice that there's an African-American sailor among him. His name is Edward Bryant, and he is a cook at the age of 18. Um, he, he was often nicknamed the Count. Uh, your mic's going out again. All right, can you hear me again? Yes. Okay. This is obviously not a good USB, so I'm gonna have to try to change it. Okay. Anyway, um, did it? Um, I'll just repeat what I said. Um, the African American sailor was a cook by the name of Edward Brennett. Um, even the cooks had to be able to understand everything on how the submarines worked, because if one person got injured, you would have to take his job. So, um. The submarine corps offered, unlike the surface navy, offered a lot of African American sailors a lot of the same opportunities that uh, their uh, European American counterparts would have had, which was kind of unique to the navy. You'll also notice that the Cobia's battle flag right there. Um, the fish itself was actually designed by an artist at the Walt Disney Company. All right, so I'm going to kind of combine the second and third war patrol, which was from September of 44, and then um, the fifth patrol ended in January of 1945. Um, they mostly, again, uh, passed uh, Saipan and did uh, a lot of uh, just basic encounters with trying to sink Japanese ships. Um, in October, it had a dogfight with a Japanese aircraft, and it caused one of the ballast tanks to actually become heavily damaged. So Becker and another sailor by the name of Clebet was the only one that had any experience with diving. So they actually had to do repairs in the middle of the Pacific Ocean without anybody else with them. And then in late October, um, there was a lot of bad storms in the area. So the crew got extremely sick, but they also passed the equator Thus, uh, the term for sailors that haven't passed the equators is polywags and sailors. Can you hear me? Yes. Now I can hear you. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to stop using that mic and then just use my uh, computers. Okay. So uh, as I was saying, in late October, um, they had m many uh, storms in the region. So a lot of the crew was reported as being sick. And then um, later in October as well, they passed the equator, which means they had the Lord Neptune 
uh, party, which means that uh, sailors that um, hadn't crossed the equator yet were known as polywogs, while after they crossed the equator, they were known as shellbacks. And again, this is an old nautical tradition that goes back to the Royal Navy, and in some cases, like the Dutch Navy. But for most of uh, November into January, they spent most of the time retrofitting the ship in Australia. Um, so this, uh, to continue on, um, she uh, rescued two more Japanese uh, POWs um, from drowning. Uh, she sank the um, mine sayer, the Yuri Shima. Uh, the Kobia again was attacked by another bomber. And then once again, uh, she rescued two more people, two more Japanese uh, sailors that had been stuck on a raft for almost 40 days. Um, so this is Captain Becker and some of the other junior and some of the other officers with him. You'll notice that most of them all have facial hair, um, and that's because uh, fresh water was a limited commodity on submarines. You had to basically save that for uh, the diesel engines. Um, and cooling them down and also making sure that the crew had enough water to drink. So uh, shaving was not a top priority. So you'll notice in many pictures of sailors that are in submarines, they will have facial hair. Um, this is one of the junior officers on the conning tower with their look, uh, doing the lookout. Um, this is the crew um, that most people that if you entered the museum, this is the picture of the crew that probably most familiar with, but once again, you'll kind of see that the guys are all kind of looking raggedy and uh, wearing kind of whatever they want to because of comfort reasons. Once again, the average temperature inside the submarine was 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And then once you get into the engine rooms, you're getting into temperatures that are over uh, 100 degrees in some points. So a lot of these guys are even overdressed for that. And you also have to take into account the Pacific is also very warm and humid. Um, this is the flag by the end of the uh, third tour. Um, by this point, the flag had been known as the sergeant, sh sergeant fish because if you look closely at the fin of the cobia design, that it has the little sergeant stripes. Um, you'll notice on the you'll, if you also look at the flags, you'll notice that um, they have the, the little red meatball means that they those are merchant vessels that they sank. And then the one with the rising star flag means that they're uh, Japanese military vessels. So again, mostly sinking Maru class or one or two mine sweepers. So I'll get more into that once we get towards the end of the war. This is the fourth patrol, which uh, happened between February and May of 1945. Um, uh, on their way in late February, they met a Dutch submarine because, again, the Dutch were uh, in uh, the East Indies at the time. Um, and they had mentioned that they encountered a Japanese convoy. Um, so when that when they came in contact with that convoy, there was a young man ma named Ralph Clark Houston Jr. He exchanges fire with the Japanese uh, boats for, se for several minutes, but he's eventually killed in action. He is buried at he was buried out at sea in Vietnam and off the coast of Vietnam. And basically the, uh, they used the Yaleman's door to help slide him in. And then most of March did not see any action. So this is Ralph Clark Houston Jr. himself. The, the way that you see him dressed um, on the deck of the Cobia is actually generally how the crew would have looked like underway where they'll have maybe their hat on. And then they're like swim trunks and shoes, uh, again, because of heat. Uh, he was a seaman first class. He was born on September 27th, 1925. So that means he was only 19 years old when he passed away. And he had only been on the Cobia for literally about two weeks before his tour of duty. So he was on it a very short time. Uh, this is the gun that he was manning when he was battling against uh, the Japanese ships and uh what was mentioned in um i'm going to hold up this book this is called the uss cobia at war it was written by a guy that served on the cobia while she was in bayview so he had he goes into great detail about explaining what would happen but i'll kind of make it uh brief and quick 
Um, what happened is when he was firing his, when he was firing this 20 millimeter, um, some of the guns started to jam because they weren't loaded properly. So, you know, you get a few uh, bangs off eventually hitting the enemy vessel, but at the same time, Ralph ends up getting hit by 50 millimeter anti, uh, artillery or by artil basically anti, uh, artillery rounds. And he gets, you know, basically punctured right up in the upper arm and then right here on to the lower abdomen area. So uh, if you want to get an idea of size, this is where they keep the, uh, sh this is where they would have kept the shells from the, uh, for the main deck guns. But you'll notice that's a big hole that they got from the exchange and fire. So that's the type of caliber that Ralph ended up getting hit with. So you can imagine that's a big hole. And um, in, in their, uh, mentioning during this battle, the radar is located not too far away from where this hole is located. So after the battle, um, the radar was actually da heavily damaged, so they had to try to repair it at sea. And then um, this is Ralph's uh, being buried at sea. He is so far the only known sailor who who's, uh, has a picture of his burial at sea on a submarine during World War II. So that kind of makes it a unique um, photograph in that regard, even if it is sad. Um, and then um, right here, this is during the Fifth War Patrol. This is the next kind of big thing that happened is the Cobia rescued seven down airmen. And I'll go into that in the next slide. So um, what happened right there is these guys were supposed to be flying over Saigon in Vietnam, which was nominally controlled by the Vichy French, who were uh, allied with the, the with the Axis powers for the most part. So the Japanese were allowed to kind of uh, work their way through most of Vietnam and the rest of the Indochina Peninsula. So we were using B-42 bomber missions to kind of spy on and see what was going on. And they were attacked by a bunch of Japanese Zeros. So they bailed off of their aircraft, and um, the six, six men of the crew survived, and the pilots end up floating out at sea for a while. The Cobia did not intend to actually, the Cobia was not trying to do a life saving rescue. They actually accidentally came across them. Uh, the airmen, uh, one of the airmen was actually scared that he was being captured by the Japanese, so they actually had to try to drag him out from underneath the uh, raft that he was uh, on, and then he tried uh, basically attacking the U.S. sailors with the summer, with his uh, little air, airman knife. So that that was a little bit <laughs> dangerous until they're like, we're Americans, you can relax. Um, and if you want to read more about the autobiography of some of these airmen, um, this website right, right down below is by one of the guys that was rescued by the Cobia. Post-war, they uh, for further, uh, they were on the Cobia for about uh, seven to ten days, and they eventually were beca became used to working on the subs uh, layout because some of them were already electricians. So by the time that the Cobia gets back to Australia, uh, Captain Becker makes them honorary sub members. So they and their families were always allowed to come back to the reunions at the Cobia. Um, af after the war in the 80s. So this is what I mentioned when they were basically on the little life rafts being brought in. And then this is the Cobia crew bringing them um, up overboard. So these are, and again, as you can see, as I mentioned earlier, the doorways weren't there that are on the uh, modern day museum ship, but uh, the torpedo launches were kind of giving you an idea of what she looked like during wartime. Um, the 5th and 6th Patrol, the 5th Patrol was considered one of the more successful ones, while the 6th Patrol saw a new captain come on board because Becker was needed elsewhere at the time. So he, this was the only patrol that he was not on. Um, the most important thing that happened here was the duel between uh, the Cobia and the Japanese minesweeper called the Hasutaka. Uh, the Hasutaka was a military escort that um, the Japanese had built during the interwar time period to try to 
make stop gaps for uh, basically con uh, protection for convoys. The problem is, is that they did not have enough, let's say, uh, weaponry like machine guns and stuff to properly arm this uh, minesweeper. So all of the mines were taken off and given to uh, ships that were more considered priority ones. So all they had was racks of uh, duck charges and basically most of the crew was all middle-aged men. So again, this was not considered a top of the line uh, enemy vessel, but uh, when it came into contact with the Cobia for close to six to eight hours, um, they were throwing depth charges and depth charges over the sides. And what happened is when you normally hear a depth charge, it'll click and cause an explosion. Well, what happened is the depth charges actually bounced off of the Cobia's hull and into the uh, uh, m mud in the Sea of Saigon. And if you're not familiar with the Sea of Saigon, uh, or sorry, the Sea of uh, Thailand, um, it's uh, very muddy and very shallow. So with the depth charges, they are only about 120 feet underwater. So they literally were getting stuck in the mud. So now uh, some of the power uh, runs out and one of the veterans mentions that uh, Captain Becker, or the captain said, light him up if you got him. And uh, what happened is uh, the smoke from the cigarettes, because the atmosphere was so tense, that the smoke from the cigarettes was so thick that you could literally cut your way through it. And eventually power comes back on. But now they have to deal with the fact that they can't get the rudder moving. So how do you get the boat out of the shallow waters? They literally had to rock the boat for about three and a half hours. So they had 40 men in the aft torpedo room and 40 men in the forward torpedo room, basically running backwards and forwards as fast as they could so they could shake the uh, boat literally to get it out of the uh, mud. And eventually they were successful. But that was the closest the Cobia ever came to sinking during the war and also probably the most danger she was in. And as I said... The, this is the Hashutaka. Uh, this photograph was taken in 1939 to just kind of give you an idea of what the ship looked like. Um, again, it was not considered top of the line, so it was only armed with the depth charges. And again, once they uh, threw all of them overboard, they just kind of went on their merry way, assuming they had sunk the sub. And the reason why that is is because um, this convoy was actually uh, patrolled by um, several of the Manitowoc built uh, ships or boats, as well as a few British and Dutch submarines. Um, the Baleo class, the USS Legardo, was actually sunk by the minesweeper in early May of 1945. Then um, on Mother's Day, she almost sank the Cobia. And then just a few days later, the USS Hawkville, which was another uh, Gato class submarine that had been built by uh, the by the Manitowoc Shipbuilding Company, actually was the one to successfully sink the minesweeper. And we actually have the minesweeper's um, life preserver life preserver in our collections at the museum. Okay, so the end of the war. Once again, they were mostly hanging around Saipan. Most of the crew knew that this tour was going to be relatively short because they had heard that the Soviets finally ended their non-aggression pact with Japan. So that means that the Soviets are now invading Manchuria. Um, also at this time, after the Battle of Okinawa, we had been busy bombarding the Japanese with conventional bombing raids using B-24s. So we knew that was going on. And then most of the Japanese Navy was destroyed at Leyte Gulf at the largest naval battle of World War II. So by that point, the crew of the Cobia knew that the war was pretty much going to be over. And they kind of just hung around uh, Saipan and then Australia until the end of the war. And then eventually she re returned back to New London in Connecticut by November of 1945. And as I, as I mentioned, of her six war patrols, the first, third, fourth, and fifth were designated as successful, for which she received four battle stars. And these are all under the command of Captain Becker. So he was considered the main star of the Cobia in terms of leadership. 
And then she was accredited with sinking almost 17,000 tons of uh, enemy merchant shipping. Again, majority of those were like trawlers, couple of small yacht ships. And then they took down a couple of one or two Maru class uh, ships that were, again, used by the Army or the Japanese Imperial Navy. So for being a late war uh, boat, she was pretty successful for what she was doing. Um, this is what the flag looked like towards the end of the war. Um, I believe this is a reunion flag, but you'll notice that they had the stripes for all of the um, merchant ships that she sunk under the meatball flag. And then with the rising star flag is the, all the ships that she sunk that belong to either the Japanese military or the Japanese uh, Navy. And then you also have the five, or seven down al allied pilots with a little parachute. So that was eventually added onto it. And again, each crew is allowed to kind of make up their own design for their battle ensign. Um, this is the crew at the end of the war at New London. So again, you'll notice the guys just kind of are wearing whatever, looking relaxed and like, thank God the war is finally over. All right, so after she came back to uh, Connecticut, um, this is during the Korean War period in the early Cold War period. So this is right before any nuclear, before the Soviets really had any nuclear capabilities uh, and before um, there was a lot of major aggression in the Cold War outside of the Korean Peninsula. So Cobia was put into basically the reserve fleet um, in 1946. Uh, during the Korean War, she was not sent overseas, but she mostly did uh, war maneuvers around, Flo the, around the Florida Keys in 1952, which I have a few pictures of. Her last dive was done in 1953 to make sure everything was still functional on her. And then the Navy decided that she was starting to get too old because they were starting to change a lot of the Gato and Balo class submarines into the early Guppy programs, which was starting to modernize them for the uh, earlier stages of the Cold War. So um, she was mothballed until 1959 when uh, Captain Becker, who is now in charge of a lot of the mothball fleet, uh, decided that she was going to be brought to Milwaukee because they needed a new submarine because their training platform was starting to get old. By 1959, a lot of people ask why the Great Lakes subs went down the Mississippi River. That's because the St. Lawrence Seaway did not yet exist. So um, now that it did, they were able to take her through the sea lane with all of the anchors and stuff removed because technically we have a treaty with Canada that we're not allowed to have any active warships with weaponry on any of the Great Lakes. So she has moved up. She actually got stuck for a little while and her anchor was cut loose. And then eventually the Coast Guard uh, grabbed it up and then shipped it up to Milwaukee on a flatbed truck. So this is what this is from her war maneuvers um, in Key West, Florida in 1952, along with other uh, Gato class submarines. Um, and again, these are kind of just more war, uh, Korean more uh, memorial maneuvers, I should say, um, going on at the time. Uh, again, you can still see that the crews, even into the 1950s, were still relatively relaxed and informal looking. And this is, um, again, part of their training crew in Florida. But you'll notice that all of her main guns have been uh, taken off by that point. Um, so she was only used for maneuvering. And this is general, this is about the same time of her last uh, diving as well. And now we finally get to when she was in Bayview, which was from 1959 to 1970. So Cobia actually saw the longest uh, period of her use being used as a training platform versus a um, active warship. So from 1959 to 1970, um, as I said, um, she was moved via the St. Lawrence Freeway, uh, Seaway, and then in August of 1959, she was finally moved to Milwaukee. Um, in 1960, 
Uh, both the Cobia and another Gato class submarine called the Tatog were both uh, torn from their moorings in because of a bad uh, blizzard going on. And a lot of the old timers will say that's when they watched the submarine races in Milwaukee. Um, then for the rest of Cobia's tour, or I should say rest of her time in Bayview, she was mostly used for training and sponsoring the sea cadets so they would have you know, training on ships uh, for their scouting program. Uh, she was finally decommissioned in the Navy in the uh, 1970s and then brought to the Submariner Memorial in Manitowoc because the current Maritime Museum was helped funded by a lot of the veterans who had came to Manitowoc as part of the submarine uh, crews that were in training on Lake Michigan. A lot of them obviously married local ladies, and then they eventually helped form the museum as we know it today. And then in 1986, she became a national landmark and was recognized as a international memorial for all nations with submariners. So this is um, Bayview's slash Milwaukee's first uh, submarine, the USS Tatog. She had a very successful war run and probably was one of the most successful uh, Gato class ships of World War II. Uh, but again, sort of like the Cobia, they stripped most of her guns off and only kept the rear uh, rear uh, guns on them. So this would have been where the Milwaukee uh, Riverway is nowadays, where you basically can walk around downtown um, on the little sidewalks. Uh, so that's where that would have been located at the time before they were moved to Jones Island. And again, this is Tatog with a tug uh, when she was eventually moved to Jones Island. Um, this is in 1959 when the Cobia finally came here in August. Um, the Ted Tog was kept until early 1960s. So this is the two uh, <laughs> uh, um, two submarines together. So the only time the two Gato classes are with each other. Um, and again, this is done in 1959 during the summertime. And you can obviously recognize uh, the Milwaukee Reef. Um, and then this is literally when, a, when people joke about the submarine races uh, with the moorings coming loose. As you can see, there was a lot of ice sheets at the time. So both of the submarines came loose from the moorings that they had off of the little platform right there. So literally the submarines were racing each other. And then this is again from when they got off of their moorings. So the ships are basically, or the boats are basically floating around without any rudders or anything on them. So they had to eventually be pulled back by a tugboat. And then um, this is um, from roughly the 1960s. Um, and this is uh, the Cobia when she was near uh, Jones Island. And I'm sure most of you can probably recognize that uh, little skyscraper over there in Bayview. Um, this is her at her mooring. Uh, again, this is again her at Jones Island when she's being used as a training platform. And again, you'll notice that most of her guns were taken off at the time. Um, this is a Cobia during the during one of the winter months of the 1960s. So she, you know, again, uh, pretty much just a training platform. And then in 1970, this is when she was starting to be pulled up to Manitowoc. So you can you can see her with the little famous. Uh, the lighthouse that's in Milwaukee Harbor being pulled by two of the uh, tugboats because uh, she did not have her propeller to uh, move her by herself. Uh, so the tugboats basically tugged her up to Manitowoc. So this is a nice shot of her with the city of Milwaukee in the background. Again, uh, be, being taken up to Lake Michigan. Uh, some more of uh, being tugged up to Lake Michigan or being up to like Michigan to Manitowoc. And that's kind of just the basic summary of the war patrol. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. All right. Uh, DJ, thank you very much for your presentation.
We certainly do appreciate that. I do have a couple questions here to ask you. One moment, please. Uh, okay. Were there any height restrictions for someone serving on these submarines? In general, no. Um, basically, in order to get into the Submarine Corps during World War II, you would have to go through sub school and basically you had to make sure they made sure that you were mentally sound so you weren't claustrophobic or you didn't get any uh, being afraid of being stuck in the dark. You also had to be tested to understand that you knew everything about the submarine because if one person got hurt, you know, you only have a crew of 72 enlisted men. So everybody had to know about more than just their jobs. So let's say you're a torpedo man and let's say one of the electricians had to get hurt. You had to pass tests to understand that certain section. So the answer is no, there was no height or weight restrictions. Technically, as we know of the tallest guy was about six foot seven, um, according to U.S. government records. All right. Uh, we hear much about the German U-boats. Is it true that American subs sank more shipping than the German subs? Yes. Um, the, the German sh submarines were fairly successful at the start of World War II, not necessarily because they were high class, because you got to keep in mind, German the German economy's peak production did not happen until 1944. And by that point, the Soviets are already steamrolling them on the Eastern Front. So uh, most of the submarines did what they call the wolf pack attack. Um, so the two advantages that they had at the start of the war was that, that they had slightly better sonar and that their uh, torpedoes were a little bit better than the Americans. But um, overall, the Germans you know, were fairly successful at the start of the war because the British had no idea what they were doing. And really early on, they didn't have any allies. But by the time the United States starts getting involved with the convoy system, they come up with deterrence and they start using radar. They start using sonar, and that makes the German wolf pack attacks much less successful. If you kind of want to get an idea of their attrition rate, almost 80% of all U-boats ended up sinking over the course of the war. So the Germans basically attacked hard and then never came back home. While our submarines, again, were what we would consider fleet class, which means that they were much larger than the conventional German U-boats, which means that they could patrol by themselves and had a much greater range of, technically they could cir circumnavigate half the globe if they needed to, but you wouldn't want to do that under your own, own power. But our subs could go farther. Our torpedoes weren't that great, but um, again, as long as they hit the target, that helps. Uh, the submarine corps sank almost 55% uh, of all Japanese merchant vessels and a bunch of military vessels, meaning that only 2% of the entire Navy did 55% of the entire damage, if you kind of want to get a scope of how important submarines are. All right. Uh, what was the largest ship ever sunk by a submarine? Um, uh, th there's a couple of cases. Probably one of the most, uh, at least in terms of American, uh, they managed to sink the Japanese uh, battleship, the Congo, which was um, in the 1920s era heavy battleship. So that was one of the bigger ones. A Gato class submarine. Um, I'm sure everybody's probably familiar with the Japanese battleship, the Yamato, uh, or the Yamato. Um, one of Yamato's sister class ships was turned into an aircraft carrier. And one of the Gato class subs was actually able to puncture a big hole into the side of it. It didn't sink it, but it basically rendered it inoperational for the duration of the war. So um, they could pack a punch if they needed to, but you generally don't want to go after warships because warships have things that can destroy you. All right. Are there any other World War II submarines still preserved today? Yes, um, there are six Gato class submarines that are still preserved within the United States. Uh, there's the Silver Sides, which is in um, Michigan, the USS Cod, which is in, uh, I believe, Ohio. Uh, there's one in San Diego, one that's dry docked in Oklahoma that recently, due to all the floodings, literally floated down the river and now is in place in a new 
area because they never expected the sub to ever move again. Uh, that happened just last year. And then um, I know that there's one in uh, Pearl Harbor. All right. Um, did any other countries use the Gato class submarine? Yes. Uh, the Gato class after World War II ended uh, was obviously starting to become obsolete. So a lot of smaller nations that were joining NATO obviously needed to form their own navies. So uh, again, through like the uh, Marshall Plan and then other lend lease programs that happened post-war, all of a sudden you get uh, Taiwan uh, getting Gato class submarines. You get Turkey using Gato class submarines. Um, you have some South American countries using Gato class submarines. And probably most ironically, the Republic of Japan actually ends up using Gato class submarines as their main self-defense, uh, main submarines in their own self-defense force post-war. And then Korea also used Gato class uh, ships. Um, so the ones that weren't sold off ended up becoming part of the guppy programs, which would become the forerunners to using stuff like the Trident missile system and then eventually the uh, nuclear submarines. All right. Are some of the former servicemen from the Cobia still with us today? Yes, there are three men that are still alive from the, the Cobia. Okay. And I, I think we know the answer to this, but someone did ask it, so I will ask it. Could the Cobia still submerge or put to sea today? <laughs> she has one dive left in her, no resurfacing. The, the reason why is um, the bulkhead doors that are on the um, boat uh, basically would have let in all of the water and... Um, we don't have a propeller either, so she can dive, but she can't come back up. Okay. Uh, Cam, do I still have time for a couple of questions of my own? I'm sorry, uh, your mic isn't working. That helps. Uh, yeah, we looks like we've got about uh, just under five minutes here yet, so yeah. Um, uh, DJ is... There is a, uh, a group of reenactors, is that not correct? Correct. The Cobia? And are you a yes. member of that group? Yes, I am. I helped uh, found it about six years ago, along with my father and one of my friends that was on the uh, one of the nuclear submarines um, during the Iraq War. So uh, he was a torpedo man's uh, mate. So uh, the three of us helped uh, gather the resources together. And we do it about three or four times out of the year on the submarine itself. Um, obviously, COVID is going to kind of get get in the way of it, but we'll probably post once it gets back up and going again. Okay. Uh, and where will you post that? I would be interested in covering that for uh, the Marine History Society. Uh, probably on the Facebook page. Um, okay. We also have a group on uh, Facebook for the re for the reenactors called the USS. Cobia reenacting uh, group or something along those lines. All right. Do you reenact a specific Cobia crew member? I, I do not, but um, I pretend to be the Yale. I basically pretend to be the Yale man who is the guy that's in charge of pay and a lot of the secretarial uh, jobs on the Cobia. I sometimes also do one of the lieutenants or chief petty officers, depending on how many guys we have on the boat at the time. Have you ever met any of the Cobia survivors? Uh, yes, I have. Um, the, one of the guys was up during one of the first subfests, and he's like, this is so cool seeing people basically wearing his old uniforms. All right. Uh, Cam, do you have any questions? Uh, that covers it, I think. Um, we had some questions about submarine races, uh, but I think we covered that. Um, so unless there's other questions, um, thank you, DJ, for this wonderful, informative uh, presentation. Um, let's see. Um, and yeah, if there's um, if you folks in the audience have questions or want more information, please feel free to reach out to um, the Maritime Museum. DJ here works with us, the Humane Society, or I'm sorry, Historical Society. <laughs> Um, and then we can be reached uh, online um, or through Facebook. 
and uh, thanks all for tuning in tonight. I believe that the wasn't the Fairbanks one the uh, secondary uh, torpe or secondary engine room. Uh, to my knowledge, um, they're all General Electric uh, engines. Yeah. yeah, the Fairbanks Morse um, were in some other Gato classes, not the one. Well, yes, some some of the Gato, not Cobia though. Yeah, I was pretty sure Cobia was always uh, GM. Folks that were visitors, I haven't had the luck or the opportunity to meet any uh, of the Cobia crew members yet, unfortunately. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. I hope we uh, have the opportunity to meet some during Subfest uh, this coming summer. And um, you know, of course, they're a wealth of knowledge about firsthand information. It's just unbeatable. But, um, with that brings us almost up to an hour. Um, so like I said, thanks for tuning in and have a great night. You too.